it looks like we're going to be getting a lot more games that were exclusive coming to pc and uh we're gonna we're gonna talk about that on this episode of the nerd nest podcast it's me it's russ it's carrie and let's start off with this article uh basically it's an interview with sean layden who used to work at sony for like 30 friggin years right and he had some very interesting things to say so he said when your costs for a game exceed 200 million dollars exclusivity is your achilles heel it reduces your addressable market particularly when you are in the world of live service gaming or free to play and we're going to talk more about live service games and some other company that is making all kinds of terrible decisions about that <laughs> um another platform is just another way of opening the funnel and getting more people in he followed that up by saying, in a free-to-play world, 95% of the people that you are trying to target are never going to spend a dime. So you need to be able to, you, you got to be able to upsell those people. And the more people that are playing that game, the easier it is for you to find somebody to spend money on your game. So again, get your game out in front of other people. He also said that single player games aren't facing this same pressure, but if you're spending $250 million on a game, you need to get it in front of as many people as you can, even if it's just 10% more. So I figured I would start off this idea with, I mean, look, we, we've been talking about it ever since the show started, like we're getting more and more ports from consoles on PC, and it's like the best time to be a PC gamer. Uh, Carrie, what, what do you think about what Sean said? Uh, you know, we, we've been talking about this a number of times, um, in the previous podcast and, uh, there are some other parts that I, I've watched some snippets from the, the interview with Sean Layden and how he doesn't think, uh, making single player games day and date available is the juice worth the squeeze. And I have to wonder if he is just saying that much like how, you know, how, um, uh, uh, Phil Phil Spencer said uh, Starfield's not gonna Starfield's not coming to PlayStation when eventually you know that's gonna be coming to PlayStation right like he he can say no now but it's gonna eventually come to PlayStation so there's there's a part that you know you look at the whole thing and this is a thing that I think again is the Chucky cheesification that we've seen a long time happen to the arcades and now it's coming to consoles and not for nothing but like my kids. My son plays Roblox, like almost exclusively. He's like ninety percent Roblox. He'll he's played he's put two thousand hours or something into Dead by Daylight. Like he plays he likes asynchronous horror games. He likes those those types of things. So uh, Friday the Thirteenth, he's put in hundreds of hours. But then he'll go and play a Roblox version of Dead by Daylight. Uh, and it seems odd to me that he would do that when he already has the full fat version and he has a bunch of DLC that he's bought. But he always goes back to Roblox and the better version. Yeah, yeah, right. <laughs> uh, but it's it's interesting to see because I watch my son doing this, and this is his platform. That's his that's his gaming arena, and for him, like that, you know, for us, all of us old people, we're you know, for especially for the console side of things, you can be uh, tribalist to whatever you know, Nintendo, Sony, or or Microsoft, or even Sega, right? Like you you have those those tentpole roots that we all kind of kind of align ourselves with and these newer generation kids are Fortnite and roblox they're not even looking at these other platforms so this is the reality also a thing that i don't think a lot I'm, some people may be aware of this my nephew is go moving to pc you know why he's moving to pc because that's what, what? all the streamers do the streamers oh, play on okay. pc they, they use keeper and mouse because that's only what legit legit gamers do <laughs> Yeah, my uh, son only plays. Uh, well, he, I don't want to say only plays. He plays mostly on keyboard and mouse, and I'm mostly a controller guy. Right. And like, he's always saying that it, you know, play on keyboard and mouse. It's better. It's better. It's better. I'm like, yeah, but I suck at that. So no, I'm not going to. <laughs> yeah, I've been always ambidextrous with that. I like there's certain games that I just prefer to play with uh, a controller, and then there's certain games that I prefer to play with keyboard and mouse. RTS, for example, is like only keyboard and mouse. I've played like Halo Wars is a fairly decent adaptation to controller, but not really. But yeah, so this is going back to that thing is 
the reason that Sean Lane is saying this is the gaming landfield is changing right in front of our eyes. And all of the old people might be somewhere that this is a, that that gif that I, I pasted on Twitter is uh, the that Simpsons part, right, where uh, Homer's talking to his dad when he's back in the 70s, like, you don't get it. You don't you don't you're not with it. He's like, I used to be with it, but then it changed. And then I didn't <laughs> like what it was. <laughs> and soon it's going to happen to you. And we're we're seeing that. That's what we're seeing. Yeah, you look at the um, uh, what Sean Layton was saying, like where where you said that something you said something about um, day and date mm. uh, doesn't work, and then you get Square Enix saying, "Look, the only reason that we were able to make Final Fantasy VII remake the way that we were, or Rebirth, sorry, is because we only had one system to worry about. We didn't have to make." two or three versions of the game we we could focus because we only had one system to make and so i think that those exclusives that we see especially third party exclusives but even first party or second party exclusives those games are going to be timed exclusives in the future because there's just too much money sitting there on the other platform ready for the taking what do you think about that russ it's it's weird because I think Final Fantasy VII Rebirth is the perfect example of what we're talking about because it is a game that, yeah, they, they made it because they could only focus on one. But I'm not buying it because I'm going to wait for another port because it's going to come inevitably like it did for the other. And so it's like, well, I'll just wait for the PC one. Like mm -hmm. as soon as I heard that it's only PS5, I thought it was going to be day and date with both PS5 and PC when it was first coming out. I'm like, oh, perfect. I'll be able to play it on PC or whatever. But then when I heard PS5, it gave me pause where I was like, well, I, I know it's going to be on PC at some point just because of their track record with the other releases. I, and so they lost um, that income from me. Because not only am I not going to pay sixty dollars for it, but I'll probably once it gets to PC, I will or seventy dollars. Once it gets to PC, I probably will wait for it to go on sale as well. And so, uh, it's it's a weird place to be in where there's definitely multiple options. You know, those multi-platform releases make a lot of sense because you can pick where you want. But the exclusivity thing probably helps them from a development standpoint, but also loses sales too. And so it's 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 really hard to say. You know what I mean? Like I am not into Final Fantasy VII Rebirth uh, right now when I probably should be, and it's because it's only on PS5, and I, I'd rather have the choice of having it on PC so I can play it on Steam Deck and all the other stuff. So if it were a day and date on PC and PS5 at the same time, would you do you feel like you would still wait for it to go on sale, or would you pick it up, right, like, would you be playing it now? I would probably have pushed myself to finish the remake because I'm, I'm on chapter 16 now, right? So I'm almost done. I, mm -hmm. If I knew it was going to be on PC, I would have like made an event for myself where I would have pushed myself through to finish it. And then I would have, um, you know, bought it on day one to be part of the hype. Because I like being part of that where it's like people are sharing on Twitter, oh, this cool thing or whatever. Like I want to be in part of that as well. Very, very rarely, maybe like once a year. Is there a game that I want to play as it releases, you know? Um, but I was kind of thinking for that one that I was going to do it until I heard that it was on PS5. And I'm like, ah, screw it. I mean, th that's definitely fair. I will say that you do get like f for the people who wait that don't buy the game when they first came out, they always get the best, not, they get the best deal because mm -hmm. all the nonsense that's been broken for a while has had a chance to get fixed. A lot of times it, when it comes to PC, we will get it at a cheaper price. I mean, I'm sure when it ships, it'll be $70, but I'll bet you there'll be some kind of, some kind of deal where you would get something that was that, that previous, like maybe DLC or something will be included. You know, so maybe if there's DLC for Rebirth like there was for Remake, like maybe that'll be included in, because that's when I bought uh, Final Fantasy Remake Intergar, I Intergrade, I don't know what it's called, um, on my Steam Deck, um, I got all the DLC with it. And when I bought it on my PS4 and then later, you know, upgraded to the PS5, I didn't have that DLC. And I didn't buy that DLC on my PS5 because I had already picked it up for, for PC. So I ended up playing that game in two different places. Um, so I do think that that's like this idea of the delay between the two. I understand from a 
development standpoint why that's useful to them but you know they missed out on that sale or did they miss out on that sale because you're gonna buy it eventually you know what i mean so yeah i just wonder if they're gonna um you know are they gonna make financial decisions based on the performance of a game but they are already shooting themselves in the foot by not having it on multiple platforms so like oh this one's not doing well and they're like, oh, it must not be a good game. Let's not invest in it more. I'm like, wait, <laughs> like the whole reason it's not doing well is because you only are excluding yourself to PlayStation 5 owners, right? Yeah. It's already a like limited number of people who are even going to buy the game in the first place. Then they also have to be Final Fantasy fans. And mm-hmm. so it's it's they're they're pushing the threshold down themselves and then saying, Oh, well, it's not selling well. It's like, dude, put it on PC. <laughs> well, although it is it is selling well. I I don't know, I don't have this in front of me. But I thought I remembered reading something earlier this week that um, Final Fantasy VII Rebirth is, I think it's the second most bought game on disc for Mm. PS5. And then Final Fantasy XVI was the one that was before that, um, Mm. which tells you a lot about discs not not selling as well because we know that like Hogwarts Legacy, you know, that came to PS5 and it's like one of the best selling games of last year or actually the best selling game of last year but mm-hmm. that's beside the point the, the the point is is that well now i've i've kind of forgotten where i was going with that but the <laughs> the uh the idea is that getting these games out at the same time on multiple flat platforms i wonder if the quality would suffer so uh yeah. the one there is one thing that i want to talk about because i've seen it as well i put it in our little chat here is uh gimetsu uh, has reported the the four day sales versus the three day sales of <clears throat> Final Fantasy 16 versus Rebirth, and Rebirth is doing worse than 16. Hmm. Uh, and it had an extra day uh, of sales data. The attach rate during that first week was eight percent for Final Fantasy 16 and five percent for Final Fantasy 7 Rebirth. So right now, sales um, overall, especially in Japan, are doing very poor, and um, there is going to be at at some point you're going to have to wonder like for me and Russ we're content with waiting because we know the PC port is coming and there there is a subset of people that are content with waiting because we're going to get the gaudy version that's all patched up anyway when the timed exclusive comes or you know the time exclusive ends so you're going to be in a situation where these companies are um giving customers enough information that they know that they'll be able to get the better version on the platform that they want later on. Meanwhile, all the marketing dollars that they used on their single exclusive part was all dried up and used for just that single platform. And there is going to come a a, a point where if there's enough of us, if there's enough me and Russes out there that they're going to have to do day and date because they have already established this, PC port is coming just at some point in time right. thing. Um, because at some point you're going to have this diminishing number where people are like, oh, I'll wait for the PC version. Because the the reality is that Final Fantasy itself is a game for our demographic. It's not for, it's not for younger kids. You know, younger kids could play it and enjoy it. They're just playing, you know, Fortnite. It, honestly, if you put Final Fantasy characters in Fortnite, that'd probably have a bigger selling effect for Final Fantasy, <laughs> the game selling, right? Like just making the DLC of like characters like Cloud in uh, Fortnite would be a bigger marketing uh, event than doing anything else more than likely. So this is the reality that, that we're all, all coming in. And, and, you know, as our demographic fades away because we can't spend money anymore, <laughs> It's going to be interesting what happens. I I, I really don't know. Um, then there's also the Game Pass side of things where people are still adamant that Game Pass is um, not... It is... Uh, what is the word I'm looking for? It's not sustainable. Mm-hmm. It is not sustainable. And to Russ's point, uh, FOMO does exist, right? You want to be in part of the zeitgeist of whenever a game comes out on day one. You want to play it because you want to be able to talk about it with people. But a seventy dollars dollar... spoiled, yeah, the right. seventy dollars price tag on a platform that may not be your preference may be a big enough pill that you don't want to swallow. Whereas with Game Pass, there the barrier to get in is so much lower. So I wind up do playing games on day one just because of Game. 
honestly, the only reason that I actually play on Xbox at all anymore is because of Game Pass. Uh, if Game Pass hmm. didn't exist, I wouldn't have bought uh, an Xbox Series X at all. Um, so the, the, the industry is changing in, in rapid ways between mobile and free-to-play games and the new platforms, the new metaverse platforms like Roblox and Fortnite. And mm -hmm. there's a lot to contend with, with our demographic where we, I mean, we are almost game smugs, right? Like when I say us, like we're not s sm smugs, but like when we, we look down on Roblox, we look down on Fortnite, like Pleh, free to play games, like, eh. like you should, you should <laughs> culture yourself and play good games. Um, well, I'm not like that. People right. play whatever the hell they want, but right. I know what you mean. <laughs> yeah. I mean, Final Fantasy VII Rebirth looks dope. I'm not even a big Final Fantasy f uh, fan anymore, but when I see it in action, I see the combat se sequences, I'm looking forward to actually playing that. I'm going to skip Remake altogether and just go play Rebirth and, and have a, a grand old time uh, when it comes out on PC. So uh, for me, I'm, I'm looking forward to it, but I can totally wait, and I know it's eventually going to come, and uh, it's going to be interesting to see how how tight these times, timed exclusives start getting down because it used to be like two years, and then it was a year, and maybe we'll get to six months and then, you know, we're, we're going to have to see what happens. Um, right. I think for, uh, for a lot of uh, like for Final Fantasy in particular, like they probably have already have a lot of the work done that they needed to get done in order to bring it to PC. So when you go from, you know, bringing a brand new game to PC instead of a sequel that's, you know, reusing a lot of assets and that kind of thing, um, I feel like that's one thing that makes it easier to bring it to PC. So maybe that'll actually happen faster. But uh, while you were talking, I was looking down at my phone because I was doing a little bit of math. And the the reason I was doing the math is because uh, you talked about how the numbers of games that are sold uh, of uh, Rebirth is down from f uh, Remake. And uh, it's important that I just wanted to point out that Remake came out at the end of of a generation whereas rebirth is coming i don't i guess in the middle of the generation and there's a lot fewer ps5s out there than there are ps4 and so uh in when when final fantasy remake came out in japan there were 9.1 million ps4s at that point in japan so 9.1 potential million potential customers and it had an attach rate of 7.8 percent roughly if i did the math on my phone right the um rebirth when that came out there's only 5.3 million ps5s in japan when right. that game came out and it has a an attach rate of 336,000 or 6.3 or yeah, six point three percent. So it is a lower attach rate, but I don't think it's that much lower. I think mm -hmm. the reason it's not selling as well is because there's just not as many people that have access. Like 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 Russ was saying, not as many people have a machine that can play it. So they're like, well, I'm not going to buy it, and yeah. they'll yeah. wait for the PC version, or eventually they'll have a, a PS5. What were you going to say, Russ? Another aspect, too, and I think Carrie is kind of hitting on it, is like, you know, it's our demographic. We have been waiting 25 years for this remake. Yeah. Like, I can wait another year. Like, no problem. You know <laughs> what I mean? Like, what's another year when I've been waiting this long to play Final Fantasy VII, like, with upgraded graphics? Like, I don't really care. Another point that I had, like, very similar idea was, like, for example, Sega Saturn. That is a... That is a coveted system for me. That is something that I used to see in magazines when I was a teenager and be like, that is the next generation. Look, it looks like Virtual Fighter Arcade, you know, like that was just so amazing to me. Uh, when I first started emulating it, I was, you know, it was all running choppy. It's a very hard system to emulate. Obviously, I didn't have the systems to do it. And I was like, oh, it's almost there. It's kind of magical, you know, and I was like, I've been waiting 30 years for this. I will wait another year. Like, I got no problem waiting a bit. And so I think that's kind of how we are with Final Fantasy VII in particular. It's just not a huge rush for us. Uh, it's a story-driven game. It's a story we already know. Um, yeah, it's 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 one of those where, yeah, I, I made that decision partially because I knew that I didn't mind waiting for another year if I play it on PC instead. Yeah, and if you take Final Fantasy out of the equation, you just talk about the idea of games that are temporarily an exclusive on a console that eventually come to pc um 
those games, like a lot of people are okay just saying, well, I'm just going to wait because I have so many games mm. at my fingertips at any point in time. Yeah. So I can wait. I don't have to rush out and and play this right away. I can wait. And because people know that, that does hurt those consoles. Like the idea that we know that it's eventually going to come to PC might hurt it. And so sometimes you might worry that the devs or the publishers might say, well, then we can't make those announcements. We can't tell people that it's going to come. So people will just sit and wonder. But with the number, excuse me, the number of people that are on Steam, like we just had this uh, from SteamDB that said 35 million concurrent users on Steam and 11 million were actively in game at the same time. That like that was just on the tenth. Oh, that's today. Yeah. So that was at nine thirty seven this morning. That a new thirty five million concurrently online users. That's just too big of a market for the people that are making games that come to console first. It's too big of a market to ignore. Yeah. So I'm I'm looking up uh, countries by population size. <laughs> So yeah. Ukraine is 36 million. The entire country wow. of Ukraine, you know what I mean? Yeah. All those people in it, every grandmother, every baby, they were all online on Steam, metaphorically. But, you know, that's kind of crazy. Malaysia, 34 million. That's an entire country. I've been to Malaysia. The place is huge. There's so many people there. They were all playing Steam. It's crazy. Yeah. And 11 million of those people were actually in a game, not just with their computer sitting on someplace. Uh, that's, right. So it's impossible for people to... Um, for publishers to ignore that, which is mm. why it's a great time to be a, a PC gamer. Um, let me ask you will... one. Go ahead. Sorry, let me ask you a real quick question. You brought this up that they leave it vague about how long the exclusivity is. Do you think leaving it vague hurts them more than it helps them? Well, oh. so I, I, you know, I was going to say you had a uh, one of you guys when you mentioned that Starfield. They said, "Oh, it's not coming to PS5," even though it probably still is. They probably sold so many of those on Xbox with that one statement because people are like, ah, screw it. I guess I will get it on Xbox. You know what I mean? Because it's, it's true. It's the landscape's going to change a year from now. It might be a different story, but at least right now that statement sold units. And I think that was smart. Yeah. I, and I agree that, um, first off he's, he did say, well, when he said Starfield's not coming to PS5, that's not actually what he said. He was in his little podcast, and I'm going to put podcast in quotes because that was uh, not a podcast. Um, it was not a conversation. It was like pre-done nonsense. Mm. And I, I, honestly, I bet you they did multiple takes, mm. and they were switching cameras based on when they were doing cuts for those takes to get it exactly right. And one of the what 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 was he was actually asked is, hey, these four games that are coming to PlayStation, what are those four games? are they Starfield and Indiana Jones? And he said, no, those are not the games that we're bringing to PlayStation. Uh -huh. And then when he was asked about it again later, he said, well, I'm certainly not going to rule it out because you never know what's going to happen. But right now, these are the four games that are coming. So mm. at no point did he say, unless I'm mis misremembering, at no point did he say it's not coming to PlayStation. Right. Yeah, no, absolutely. But he, the wording up front when you look at it, <clears throat> because even though they say, you know, it, right now, no one has Sony ever said out loud that uh, God of War Ragnarok is coming to PC at any point in time. I don't think that they have ever said that, but the or if they have, I don't think that they gave any date about it. The only thing they say is like console exclusive or even if you've seen that point I'm trying to make is that there is uh, a f a flexing of the word where it's technically the truth, but you're not being forthcoming. And I mm. have to wonder, like God of War Ragnarok, when did that come out? It came out over a year ago at this point, right? Yeah. 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 So if it comes out in November, that's a two year timed exclusive. That's a long time. If, right. If in my head, I thought it was going to be a year or six months and it's already well past that. Did it benefit Sony for just saying, look, it's coming on PC, but we're not going to bring it there until at least two years. Because if you give a hard number for someone, right. then they're like, well, I don't know if I want to wait two years. 
But if you just make it vague, once they get up to a year, it's like kind of like how we said yesterday. You're in a you're a, a frog in a pot that's boiling, and you don't know how boiled you've already been because your your reference point is today. So if you have to wait a year from today, where it's already been a year, does it benefit Sony for not saying it? Mm. And that's the thing I wonder: is are they better off just giving the number, especially if it's a long way away? But if it's six months away, is that it? That's probably a hindrance. So. I understand there's there's like a, a thing there, but I I have to wonder, the the vagueness of it is is I think would be a net negative only for me and Russ because we have this, <laughs> you know, or people like Russ and I where we're we're content with waiting and it could be an indefinite number. It could be a year before Final Fantasy right. Rebirth comes to PC. I know for me because it's going to be coming to eggs first. And it's going to be like another six months or whatever before it comes to Steam that I even have a longer wait because I'm not going to get it on, on Epic Game Store because it's mm. it's a hassle. I I don't want to install the Epic Game Store on my Steam Deck as a second thing and do all the fluff just so that I can play it on the Steam Deck. I will just wait and I'll just continue yeah. waiting for it to be on Steam. Um, and I think but, another good point to yours is that like for Ragnarok in particular... Uh, that crossed the threshold where I like pre pre-ordered it, like pre-downloaded it. I took two days off from the channel and I just played it, you know. And so there are certain games that will meet that meet that threshold, and I didn't even care about the whole PC port. I knew it was probably going to come because the first one had been there. I didn't care. I wanted to live that story, and so those two years were like not worth waiting for me. So it really depends on the game. So if you're watching this on YouTube. Um... Leave a comment down below that like button. And I want to know, Just we'll just assume that day and date, not happening for, for games. Uh, outside of games as a service games, which we'll talk about very soon. Um, but like a single player, console exclusive, being ported to PC. I want to know, how long is too long? And how short is too short? Because carries like, if, a, if they give us a definite number... You know, people can get out their calendar and they can write like Ragnarok Day. And then every day they can cross off a date and they keep getting closer and closer. They know when it's going to happen. And so they can end up, uh, they can plan for it and pick it up. How long is too long for you to sit there with your calendar hitting X each day? And how long is too short where you think that people would just say, oh, it's just going to kill any sales on the console? Let me know what you guys think in the comments down below. Um, let's move on and talk about <laughs> WB Games. Oh my God, what is wrong with these people? So <laughs> they they put out uh, Suicide Squad Kill the Justice League, a live service, games as a, a games as a service style game, performed terribly, absolutely terribly. In fact, uh, there were there were articles saying that it had fewer people playing it than people playing Gotham Knights. On a, a game <laughs> that's a similar like games as a service style, you know, multiplayer superhero genre game that came out m like two years before it or maybe a year before it. And this one was already just fallen on its face. So it did not do well. WB also put out last year the best selling game of the year, Hogwarts Legacy. And they. They put out both of those games, the best-selling game of the year and the game that fell on its face. And you would think that they would look at their, you know, the, the the little columns on their spreadsheets and say, well, you know what? We're doing pretty well from Hogwarts Legacy. We should maybe make more games like that because that seems to be what people are interested in. But this is what they said. They said... It's a great business when you have a hit like Hogwarts Legacy. It makes your year look amazing. Unfortunately, we also have disappointments. We just released Suicide Squad this quarter, which was not at strong. It makes it very volatile. Um, then they, they said, within the studio segment, we're doubling down on games as an area where we think there's a lot more growth opportunity so we can tap into that IP, and they want to make more live service games even though it's not doing very well for them now i think that there's a lot of times where like jimmy who's not on the show today but he said recently you know the, all these companies keep trying to get us to play this one game and it's like our job to play that game 
because it takes up all your time and then invests you in it. So you're willing to spend a bunch of money on it. But you can't do that. Like, there can't be two of those games because I'm not going to play both of them. You know what I mean? I, can, I only have time in my life for one game that takes up all my time. And so these games are really hard to make win, but WB is going after it. Carrie, what do you think, man? Oh, boy. Yeah, this is a this is a tough one. Um, you know, it's the Wayne Gretzky uh, quote, right? Like, don't go where the puck is, go where the puck is going to be. Yeah. And, and I, I can commiserate with where their feelings are because they see that uh, live action games are where all the buku bucks are made. But they're, the reality is, is that there isn't enough time in anyone's life. If you took all, like, whatever, 10 billion people that existed on planet Earth, we wouldn't have enough games and time for everyone's life with how much exists already. Right. right? Like it's, it's, There's just too much. We, it's not even a money problem anymore. Making games $70 a pop, even though some people lament it, the reality is, is that there's too much. My backlog is outrageous. I could retire today and try to make a concerted effort and even like being conservative, like, you know what, this game isn't for me and I'm going to drop it. I'll pay 20 minutes and whatever, you know, be like over aggressive with uh, how fast I'd drop a game. I could do that and I still wouldn't be able to crack through all of my backlog and not even talking about newer games that are coming out from this day forward, right? Like that's how bad of a situation it is that I could just... I have too much to play and everyone has too much to play. And then you have free to play games. So many free to play games. If you just look on steam and go to free to play, you're going to see games that you've never even heard of before that people are playing. And it's mm -hmm. like, there's so many like weird things that are going on that I find it tremendously difficult to even crack into the live service area of stuff. Maybe they're going to take the Harry Potter franchise and try to make it, you know, a live service game out of that. They're going to tap into the Harry Potter fans that want to play like an MMO of sorts. Maybe that's something that's that's worthwhile, perhaps. Uh, I mean, the, the problem is that Suicide Squad, even when it's lead up to it, a lot of the press for it wasn't good. Every time anyone would talk about it, it was always surrounded in this negative aura. Uh, so I thought, it, for me, it was like when it wasn't doing well, I was like, well, I mean, it seems to be the case, right? Like everyone kind of said, I will say Helldivers 2 was a game that I thought, not that it was negative, but no one thought it was going to amount to anything, right? Like it was just like, oh, that's right. going to be a game and it'll be Helldivers and then it'll be whatever. And it came out and everyone was like having a great time with it. So there is always that. There's that that weird thing that you're going to catch lightning in a bottle and then you'll be able to ride that rocket uh that profit rocket to the to the moon and it's a it's a drug it's a drug that these companies want to chase and they don't want the uh single sale uh type of environment anymore and they'll 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 bankrupt their company doing so i feel like we saw this in the past with massively with mmos like uh everquest came out yep. it was a hit World of Warcraft came out and just Dominated. took over everything. The phenomenon. Yeah, that was, yeah, that it was, was PC gaming. Right. And then after that, there was MMO after MMO after MMO. And I tried all of them because that's like my favorite genre. I love that style of game where there's a big world to explore and that world is still there when I log off. And I tried like all of them. And I always ended up going back to World of Warcraft and all of those games, one by one, ended up closing their shops, except with very few exception. They all ended up closing their shops, no matter how fun they were, because getting people to own, like to only commit to your game is hard to do, yeah. especially when if you want me to commit to your game, you also have to convince my friends, because if my friends are all playing game A, and I try game B and I'm it's awesome, it's super fun. If I can't get my buddies to come over and play that with me, yep, then that game is going to fail. Yeah. And it's really, really hard for it to 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 move forward. What do you think about that, Russ? You know, it's it's weird. I never got into MMOs and mostly I was just because I didn't have the time for it. But you you make another point that just kind of thought about as you're talking about like how the world lives while you're not playing. Mm -hmm. It's it's a different uh, feeling for me too. It's like, okay, an MMO is going to die. Like when you, when you invest into that game, you start playing that game. It's not going to be there 10, 10 years from now. 
Whereas if you pick up Mario 2, it's going to be the same Mario 2 that you played mm-hmm. back in the day, right? And so that's another really interesting aspect is like, unless you get in it right then and there, unless you're part of that kind of zeitgeist of people getting involved and actually enjoying it in the moment, you're, you're not ever going to have that moment because it won't be there in another time. There are people who like keep Fantasy Star online, online, you know, stuff like that. But yeah, you know, most of them are just dead, and so that's that's kind of a unique aspect as well. The whole game preservation thing, which I've been thinking about a lot over the past couple of weeks for some reason, um, <laughs> it's just for some it's reason. one of those things where yeah, it's one of those things where it's like, man, that actually will disappear, and you'll you will only have it in your memories and the stories you tell to your grandkids, which is crazy. So you know, you talk about game preservation. I'm going to pivot and and talk talk about that. Um, this is further down in the show notes, so I'm going kind of out of order. Everybody, um, Warner Brothers is removing Adult Swim published games, uh, and they say it's due to logistical and resource constraints. Meaning that you will know they're they're del- It says here from um, I don't know if they're delisting or deleting it. Uh, I pleaded with the, with the rep. This is a guy who makes one of these games. I pleaded with the rep to transfer ownership to my company as I still retain all IP for the game rights. I sent him a link to Steam's transfer page and explained it's three clicks to transfer ownership to me. <laughs> yeah. And they said no. So instead of giving the dev of <laughs> yeah. this game the ability to continue to sell this game, they said, well, we're just going to get rid of it. And this is kind of the same, like, this is the same company that took the finished Batgirl movie, yeah. threw it in the garbage. It's the same company that took the Wiley, it, it's Wiley Coyote so versus Acme, right? Yeah. Coyote versus Acme movie. Yeah. And threw that in the garbage. And they're doing it for, what's the, for business, logistical and resource constraints. How many resources does it take to keep a game on a game store? You know what I mean? Russ, you were talking about game preservation. These games are vanishing. This keeps That's happening. What do, you, what do you say? Say stuff. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, yeah, I mean, it's on the PC side. I'm not too worried about it. I think that people will have like backed up these games or whatever, but it's still just a, it's just a shame, you know? And, you know, with all the emulation news that we've gotten over the past couple of weeks, it has made me kind of rethink things. I made a video. I wasn't planning to make a video, but I was like, you know what? I like the whole Yuzu and Citra thing. Like I, I just, it was weighing on me. Like I took a day off from working cause it was my wife's birthday. So we were like hanging all day and it was still something I kept, my mind kept coming back to. And so that morning I got into the studio, I was going to like work on whatever video. And I was like, no. I hit record and I just like talked, you know, and in that I said, you know, my, my, my kid's generation is Nintendo switch. Like that's their generation. That's the mm-hmm. one that they're going to have those fuzzy feelings about like I do with NES. And I would hate it if they're not able to play a game that they remember from their childhood because of all of the things shutting down and the games disappearing or whatever's going to happen. We know that the switch online store is going to go down at some point, but it's just a matter of when. And so uh, those things just worry me, and I, I think about that stuff, and I think, yeah, there's probably people who played some of these adult game swim or adult swim games, who <laughs> yeah, those are their games. The order there, right? <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, yeah, it's it's crazy. Um, I'm seeing, I'm, I'm looking at the list of games, you know, and there's like Rick and Morty games and stuff like that. I'm sure there are people who are going to remember that. It's kind of like those Burger King games from the Xbox 360. Those are pretty cool. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Those are also cool, fun memories that I want to revisit. I actually went and rebought those games. I've got them. I bought them on eBay for like five bucks each. And uh, yeah, it's it's just crazy that these may not be available when people actually want to play them. What do you think, Carrie? <clears throat> Yeah, this whole licensing thing. I think the thing that bothers me the most is like you look at that, right? It was a Wiley Coyote versus Acme thing. That's a movie that I would love to have seen. I it's been a while since we had like a a, a Roger Rabbit movie, and I feel like it's due. And it looked great. Cast looked great. Uh, so yeah, for them to just be like, you know, we'll make more money if we just throw this away by saving taxes. Like it'll be a tax write off. And it's like, how does how does that work? You just you just deprived all of us of stuff and. <laughs> And he's just like, you don't want to roll the bones to see if you'd make a lot of money on that. Right. All right. Uh, yeah. So, you know, maybe there is something there where 
even though it's sensationally easy for them to click three buttons to transfer ownership so that they aren't the publisher of that anymore, especially because the dude has the rights to it. Um, mm-hmm. We have to wait and see how that's going to like shake down. Is he going to be able to like make his own publisher and like after they get rid of it, like how does that all work? Uh, hopefully that's the case. Uh, but if this is just like a tax write off for them and there's just a restructuring for WB games, there's a part of there where, you know, will we remember will we like who who who's the publisher of this who who is that like i'm not going to buy it there unless it's like on steep dis- discount i own right. most of the games that are in that list the only game that i don't own is samurai jack and uh, i'll wait for that to go on sale because typically right before they do a delisting they do a heavy sale on it like a massive sale like of whatever it's going to be mm-hmm. as insofar as on steam as long as you buy it you'll be able to re-download it again the last version right. that was available um, there are some differences to how that works sometimes in um, other platforms, uh, even though it also has been the same as Steam. So, for instance, there's been like games that have been delisted on PSN or games that have been delisted on like Xbox, but you could go to your like account page and click the button where you bought it and then re-download it. But you have to do it through like some convoluted way versus like a, a simple thing like oh it's in my library let me just download it. You have to right. you would still be able to get it. So like Scott Pilgrim was one of those games that was on XBLA and PSN that you could right. if you bought it and owned it you could still get it, but you had to go through a weird way to get it. And um, so it remains to be seen how what type of thing you have to do um but you know that that the demo of uh so stellaris what is the name of that game it's the stellar blade um right they leaked yeah they the the demo came out everyone got it and not only did they remove the demo but they removed the license from people's uh ps5s that got it they were like no you will not be able to play this at all (laughs) and they actually did a thing that was more invasive than the pt demo because if you had it on pt you could still play it uh, if you download it, but no, they well, they went the next step and actually literally removed it from people's uh, ability to play, which is a step too far, I think, for a lot of people. And it, it it like really like shone a light on what is possible, like what they can do. So it's uh it's interesting times, uh, to say the least, uh, with regard to delisting games because it's always been a thing, but licenses are that way. So whenever you're talking about IP, you know, it becomes difficult and it's unfortunate, right? Like you look at Guitar Hero and Rockman and all those other things, like DLC for those were like, oh, we got you know whatever Metallica whatever there, and then it just goes away because the license that they arranged to have that on there existed for like a set period of time. And it's like why right, right. why would you do that? There has to be something written in a contract. They were like, no, once this we have the license for it, but it's in perpetuity. And I feel like people just lawyer up too much, and it's like, no, you can't. You, after five years, or whatever, or whatever happens, just got to get rid of it. And um. It's weird. It's really weird. You look at some old racing games. Some old racing games where they um where they partnered with like actual car manufacturers and they said, "Okay, hey, we've got the Porsche whatever in here and we've got the Ferrari Zibzab. I don't know, I'm not a car guy." Um but they you know, they got real cars yeah. in the games. And then they th- those those games end up getting delisted because the license to use those real cars yeah is gone who cares if your cars are real yeah i understand that that is a selling point for some people like there are some people who will buy gta gta not gta gt7 gran turismo 7 because it has real cars i bought gran turismo 7 because it's a fun racing game and I understand I'm not the only person out there. There's a lot of other people that like other stuff, and them being able to race the real cars is very important to them. But I think for most people, they would prefer fake cars yeah. to exist and then not have to worry about those licensing issues. It's really bizarre. It's re- it's so like when you think about like Guitar Hero, I could almost see the point being made. It's like, no, people might be buying it. Maybe it goes on sale, or someone's going to buy it so that they can listen to the song. And like, no one would do that like what 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 <laughs> yeah. benefit like what are you really protecting i really don't understand because if you just have a license in per- perpetuity for this particular media that is kind of set in stone what benefit does it offer you the license holder to expire the license after a set amount of years like it's only for that game i'm not saying that you have to do it for every single game that comes out ever it's for that game so it's like this is for grand Theft 7 you can only use it in Gran Turismo 7 in perpetuity. 
if you make Gran Turismo 8, you have to do a new contract with us. There's something new that has to happen. All right, that's perfectly reasonable. Like, yeah. you're thinking like a reasonable person. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <clears throat> no offense to lawyers. Silly me. A lot of times they're not reasonable. And the other thing is it's a nego it's a part of negotiation. You know, by th they could push the price to a certain, like the price for the license, a certain amount by saying, well, w w you know, we could we could uh, make it unlimited, but you're going to have to pay way more to license that for unlimited. Right. And so they can keep, like, that's how they manage the prices. It's a negotiation tactic. Anyway, I don't know. Um, let's, let's take a break from news, and we'll come back to news in a little bit because we've got uh, another uh, emulator is apparently getting shut down. We're going to talk about that. We're also going to talk about a bunch of old games coming to Steam, which is exciting, but also... Uh, problematic for something and we might mention the fallout uh trailer uh and whether or not maybe xbox is even going to continue uh but before we talk about that let's take a second and talk about the games that we've been playing uh carrie you suck and didn't put anything in the show oh. notes for what games you've been playing i'm guessing <laughs> it's because you haven't been playing anything or what? this week yeah i was on call this week and i've been non-stop oh, busy i literally okay. didn't play any game this week well, we'll never forgive you for not playing games. Uh, Russ, <laughs> um, I don't even know yeah. what the hell this is. Tell tell us about the... Well, I know the first one, but tell us about the games you've been playing, man. Uh, so the first has been... Uh, this is I had to grab a prop when we were talking about it. But um, So I've been playing my Game Boy... Uh, funny playing Game Boy Color. This is an FPGA that is uh, only plays Game Boy and Game Boy Color. But instead, like it's got a full Game Boy Color shell. Like I had to build it myself. Oh. Um, you know, IPS laminated screen and all that stuff and plays cartridges. And so I've been playing all week Tetris. Like <laughs> I have been playing so much Tetris on this thing. It is amazing. It is like the optimal way of playing. Te I mean, I've got an analog pocket. I've gotten an updated Game Boy Color. I've got a Game Boy. This thing is better by a mile, like in all of those regards. It's got that same feel as the old Game Boy Color. I mean, it's the same shell, same buttons, same membranes. Mm -hmm. I used all that stuff. USB-C charging. Uh, it has sleep mode. It's got a four, like, I don't know what the screen size is, but it's probably three and a half, almost four inches. Uh, it has a 4X integer scale if you want to go that, but I do full screen just because it's not a big difference, but I like having that larger screen. And By it's, the way, it's just I just want to interrupt real quick. Tech Dweeb yeah. has a fantastic video explaining integ integer scaling. I will try and remember mm. to include that in the show notes uh, down below the like button. Sorry to interrupt. I just wanted to say nice. that before I forgot yeah, it. Yeah. Go. So, um, so this is not expensive. That's the other thing. This thing I think is about $83 mm. once you put all the parts together and get it shipped from funnyplaying.com. It's going to come from China, so it takes a little bit of time, but all the same, the board, the screen, the speaker, the buttons, the membranes, the case, you know, you put it all together, no soldering or anything. It's just kind of pushing it all together into place. Um, like Legos. even the screen. Yeah, even the screen has just got a sticker around it, so you just push it in, you know, like mm. you don't have to do any sort of special modding. It maybe took me an hour, but I was filming while I was doing it, so that was probably a big part of it. But anyway, um, it's amazing. Like, I have been playing this thing so much. It's got a little rechargeable battery in the back, so you don't have to put in double A's or any of that kind of stuff. And uh, yeah, I've been really enjoying that. So I've been playing a lot of Tetris. I've, I'm going to Japan in about a week, and we're going for about a week and a half for spring break. And I've been thinking about just bringing this thing. Nice. And that's crazy. You know, I got like a Steam Deck. I got all that stuff, right? And I want to bring my little Game Boy Color so I can play Tetris and Super Mario Land. And well, not just that, but are you, like, you're going to go to, um, what's the place where people always go to buy video game stuff? Akihabara. Usually. Yeah. Are you going to go there and, and probably buy some, you could, you can, oh yeah. my gosh, there's something happening at Carrie's house. <laughs> um, so that's okay. Uh, are you going to go to Akihabara? Uh, how do you say it? Akihabara. Yeah. Uh, okay. Uh, well, are you going to go there and buy some some Game Boy <laughs> Color games? Uh, I am thinking about. Uh, we're, we may not go there. I'm, I'm meeting up with a bunch of people that are in Japan that I know from like Twitter and YouTube and stuff, and they're like, "Oh, don't go there. It's too expensive." So they're going to take me to other places, basically. And so, uh, so it'll be interesting. I'm going to have one day. Like we're going as a group. Like it's my wife's whole family. There's eleven of us going. So. It's not going to be a rust vacation. You know, we're going to like Disneyland, stuff like that, you know. Mm -hmm. um, but one day in particular, I'm like breaking off from them and I'm going to go do that stuff. And so that's, yeah, that we're going to be in Tokyo, like downtown at that day. And so, yeah, definitely going to do some retro shopping. I'm not really, I'm not sure about Game Boy games because I have a couple flash carts coming that I'm going to use with this. So I don't really need to buy games because I can just use that. But um, 
I am I've been building a Famicom collection, so like the Japanese version of the NES. And I've got about mm-hmm. twenty games right now, but there are a few that I think that if I can just kind of rifle through the their storage, I'll find the ones that I'm really looking for, and I'm I'm looking forward to that. And so, yeah, who knows? I'm actually doing a barter system with one of my buddies who lives there. He's he's British, but he lives in um in Japan, and he's been there for like fifteen years. So I'm I bought a PS One. And I'm taking it over to trade with him. He's going to give me a Famicom and a Famicom disc system like combo. Nice. And oh, we're both nice. paying about 50 bucks each to bring them over. Whereas if I tried to import one, you know, I'd be paying 80 or or $100 for something like that. And same thing with him. So we're each saving money by like swapping out these two systems, which is kind of funny. Do you have any Famicom disc system games? I have one. I have, a couple. I have Zelda, but I don't have any anything to play it on. Right. You know, we think about NES games and it's like, oh, yeah, that was on the NES, that was on the NES. And it's not how it was in Japan. There were some on the Famicom and some on the disc system. And so Metroid, Zelda, Castlevania, Mario 2 or Lost Levels, all of those were on the Famicom disc system. And so I've bought a couple from eBay and stuff, but they're kind of expensive, like 20, 25 bucks each. And I think I'll be able to get them for around 10 bucks each in Japan. So that's that's the hope, at least. I I really love how the discs are embossed so for the audio listeners i'm just going to describe it to you but for the video listeners you can look at it um like i'm holding up my copy of zelda for the nintendo disc system and the word nintendo is embossed in this floppy disc on both on both sides and it's just Mm -hmm. so cool that's their drm you know like that's the way that they got like copyright protections is that embossing is what actually makes it work Oh, like there's a me- there's a mechanism inside the the Famicom disk system that checks the the embossing yep. here, right? And so, like, if you have a clone or whatever, it needs to also have that embossing. And so that was their way of like anti piracy back in the day. That's as really cool. As opposed to taking down users, I love that animation. I, that's the one thing that I would like to get is the uh, original uh, Famicom Legend of Zelda, like complete mm-hmm. box. That's one thing that I mm-hmm. I would want. Um, but I want to. I, I plan on going to Japan one day as well. I'm so so jealous right now uh but yeah i want to go there and just rifle through whatever they have and just get it there as opposed to just importing it yeah yeah speaking of going places i'm going to be at pax east um me too awesome so uh carrie and i definitely will have to meet up but if you see me if you're at pax east and you see me come up and say hi because uh i would just want to say hi to people um Russ has also been playing some other game. We're going to come back to that in a second. I'm going to take a second to talk about Final Fantasy VII Rebirth, and mm. there's a complaint that I have about that game. And it's it. this is a... I don't know what it is, but it happens more in Japanese games than it does in other games. The other culprit of this is Xenoblade Chronicles X on the Nintendo Wii, where the audio mixing is just atrocious where you are trying to have a conversation you're trying to hear the conversation that the characters are I know, are, I know are having about, yeah and the music is just blaring over <laughs> that now on the ps5 i can adjust the the music or on this game i can adjust the music separate from dialogue which is nice i had it set to about seven for the music dialogue up at ten and then uh, there was this guy that I was like, I happened to be standing near him and he's sitting there playing the guitar in the game. And the guitar is completely overpowering everything that all of the characters are saying. And I'm like, I can't hear anything that they're saying. I don't understand. And it, I do have to say that I did receive this as a review copy. I'm just like for transparency. I don't understand how you can get it this wrong. How is it that, why is this only seem to happen with Japanese games? Is it because the English dialogue is recorded lower volume or something? Have, have mm. Carrie, you said you've run into this. Does it drive you as crazy as it does me? Uh, yeah, I would say that I've, I've tended to notice that this happens more so in like Japanese games where, <laughs> you know, where there's a bunch of extra audio where in other games, the audio will dip down so that you can hear the dialogue. And then, you mm-hmm. know, it'll, it'll like self-correct itself or it'll be such that the cutscene itself is designed around the, the dialogue to some degree uh but yeah i've noticed this and sometimes you're just like what what like you have to res- re- resort to subtitles all the time 
to be able to just follow what's going on. But yeah, um, I would say that this uh, is a phenomenon that I've noticed as well, but I wouldn't be able to pinpoint any particular reason why it occurs. Okay. Um, Russ, back to mm -hmm. Suica, Su Suica Watermelon? Yeah, Are you just making up words now? No, it's it's a uh, it's a game. It was actually kind of a phenomenon on Switch, and I I think there's Steam versions too. But my one of my kids' like friends was playing it on their phone. There's this website called Cool Math Games. Have you guys heard of this? Nope. This is no. like so like grade schoolers use this to play games, and the URL is brilliant because it makes teachers and adults think that they're playing math, but it's not. It's just freaking games. And so what these kids will do is they'll get on their phones like, oh, I'm just playing math games, cool math games. And it's not. It's just like full on them playing games. So it's brilliant. Whoever has that URL and all the ads and stuff is probably making a killing. But anyway, <laughs> so there is like a watermelon game. And what it is is like you drop a piece of fruit, like say it's a cherry. And if that cherry touches another cherry, then it turns into a strawberry. And then if your strawberry touches another strawberry, it turns into a grape and it just oh, okay. keeps getting bigger and bigger. And so it's like this drop puzzle game, very relaxing, has like relaxing music and stuff. Anyway, uh, the reason why I have bags under my eyes right now is because I was up to like midnight playing this stupid game on Switch. And it's fun. Like It's just like my wife's addicted to it. And so she got me into it and stuff. And um, see, I played a couple hours of that over this past week and I don't play a couple hours of anything. I'm so busy all the time. Um, but it's a pretty fun little game. Just a, a little... Like it's not a puzzle game, but it's just like a uh, cozy kind of game. And they've got there's no official Steam game of it, but there are like oh, there's multiple so many Suica style games. Yeah, out there's there. so yeah, many yeah. ripoffs. Yeah, like I just I just grabbed my Steam Deck and started searching, and they have they have one with pineapples and watermelons on there. It's called Suica yeah. Dish, or how am I am I saying that right? Suica, Suica, Suica. Suica. Yeah, because I mentioned Ghosts of Ghosts of Tsushima and everybody yelled at me so I'm going to pronounce things the wrong way on purpose to bother people uh, but there's tons there's tons of those those games on here so right that's awesome yeah but the switch one is three bucks it's an eShop game and uh that, that one's what I've been playing it on and it's yeah it's pretty awesome very cool all right back to the news um ghosts of ghosts of sushi is what I'm going to call it so people can yell at me leave all your comments down below um, it's like we, we mentioned it last episode that it might be coming. It is coming. Um, wait, did, was that two episodes ago? And then last episode, we already talked about this, didn't we? La last episode. You I think we've gotten like, yeah, we last did talk. So we talked about okay. it, like the, just the news drop of it. Yeah. Okay. So, um, real quick, the MSI claw available. Yep. You guys both bought them. Yep. Shipped. Uh, either of you got hands on with it yet? I mean, outside of Russ, when you had hands on at yeah. uh, GD or not, um, whatever conference it was, C CES. Yes. CES. Yeah. Thank you. Mine's coming tomorrow, so I'll I'll do like I'm gonna do a 24 hour turnaround. So on the day of launch, which is Tuesday, uh, I'm just lucky. Like I just bought on on Newegg, and they just happen to be shipping it early, and so uh, I'm just gonna do a turnaround on day of release, have like a first impressions video, and so that's what I'm doing tomorrow. All right. And what about you, Carrie? You uh, you doing benchmarks and everything for it? Yeah. Yeah. I'm not too impressed with the 185H. It's, uh, I, I don't know what type of software MSI is going to include with it to try to rein in whatever they can, wherever they can. Um, but it's uh, one game of that's a part of my benchmarks. We, uh, Batman Arkham Knight fails to load on it. You can make it work by doing patches and stuff. There's a community patch for it. But it's like, you know, more of the same story of what Intel is. It's, uh, it's not even Intel's fault, really, right? Because the problem that Intel also faces is that no game developer is testing any of their games on Intel. None. So it, they test for, on PC World, they test on NVIDIA first. And then AMD, because they kind of have to, they don't want to, but they do. And then when anyone says Intel, they go, Intel what? And they, oh, Intel <laughs> Arc. Yeah, all right. Well, that's a thing, right? Yeah, okay. Oh, yeah, we'll, we'll test that, I guess. <laughs> and they don't. Great. Like Starfield came out day one and it was didn't work at all. Like how, if you bought an Intel DGPU that went into a full desktop and it didn't work on a brand new game day one, you'd be like, well, come on, guys. Like, do something. <laughs> so I feel bad for Intel that they have to scramble and fix because they changed their entire G, uh, GPU U architecture. Um, so they're in a bad spot. They're in a bad spot, and a lot of it's not their fault. 
but then you know they have to deal with that, the consequences of that and it's not even just that where things are broken on some games it's also a performance problem yeah and, and uh, like i i don't know anything about this stuff but i did watch a video i think it might have been uh linus tech tips maybe i'm not sure it could have been somebody else but they were talking about how just the drivers for the for those graphics cards just aren't ready they're not ready for mm -hmm. prime time yet and that's one of the reasons that the games run like they, they they don't run as well as they should and it's because of driver issues um all right let's moving on moving on to uh, a whole bunch of old games coming to steam i tried to play one of them on my steam deck i was just just curious and it was only two dollars um but i'm gonna list off these games real quick and i'm gonna ask you guys are any of these interesting to you are you gonna pick these up command and conquer ultimate collection dungeon keeper 2 dungeon keeper gold populous populous 2 populous the beginning sid meyer's alpha centauri planetary pack sim city 3000 unlimited and the saboteur uh, any of those interesting to you guys? Are you interested in the old stuff on PC? Uh, I bought all of them except Saboteur. Okay. Uh, I'd never even heard of Saboteur. Um, why didn't you pick up that one, Carrie? Uh, just because it wasn't $2. <laughs> uh, so, yeah, I mean, there's the, there's a problem that I have. And EA games in particular, I'm a little bit less inclined to buy, only because I have Game Pass Ultimate, and that includes EA Pass. Uh, mm -hmm. So I already have these games that are I can play through the Xbox store, which has EA Pass, which is like a whole bunch of nonsense. But if I wanted to play it on my Steam Deck, I wouldn't be able to really do that. So right. this is a convenience purchase. And I, at $2, I go, like, yeah, whatever. I'll do the convenience purchase. But when it's $5, I'm like, I just need this for convenience, guys. Like, I don't would, – would this let's understand something clear here. Like, this is the reason. Right. You know what I mean? Like, so that's why I didn't get Saboteur. But Command & Conquer, I'm a huge fan of. I'm a huge fan of – like, I played that a bunch in the 90s. And, um, yeah, so I just got those because I got the complete pack for, like, 5 bucks. So it was all of them even cheaper than $2 a pop. So it's like, yeah, all right, mm. no big deal. And then SimCity 3000 I got and uh, Populous, Populous 2. I got all of them except Saboteur. Russ, you, you know, retro game core, these are very much retro games. Did you pick these up or did you say, I didn't. Nah, not really my jam? They're, yeah, I mean, I didn't ever play PC games up until recently. And so these like never really hit with me. I, I remember these names like Red Alert and Populous and stuff. But I just went to the EA page on Steam and sorted it by what's on discount. I did see that Jade Empire Special Edition is three bucks right now. So I'm probably going to pick that one up. I played that on the original Xbox. That was a great oh, nice. game. It was like Knights of the Old Republic, right. but uh, you know, like that's awesome. So I'll probably pick that one up. But yeah, for the others, I'm not not too sure about that. So. I ended up picking up Populous. Yeah. Uh, I just wanted to try it out, and there's DRM, um, but not the kind of DRM that you're used to. It's the old yeah. DRM yeah. where it was like check your manual. Yeah, look at your <laughs> manual. Uh, so like it, like I open it up and I go to the tutorial and it's like, what's your name? And I type in bill and it's like, okay, what world uses this shield? And I'm like, what? <laughs> I, I don't know. And I look and they don't provide the manual for you to download. So I felt like I didn't know what the hell I was doing, but what happens is if you just bring up your keyboard on your steam deck and press enter, it skips through it. And so mm. you can, you can get past it. But there's nothing in there to tell you that. I had to, like, I Googled it. I was like, what the hell am I supposed to do? And somebody said, press enter at this spot. And I was like, oh, okay. Which, if you're using, if like, if you're trying it on a Steam Deck, you, that's the last thing that you would think of. Because there is there is no enter key. I had to, you know, press Steam and X in order to bring up my keyboard and then press enter to, to move on to the next thing. It, look, they didn't you know they don't say that it's verified on steam deck or anything so is is it a big deal no and is it it was two dollars i was fine trying it for two bucks because who cares um i just thought that was really funny that they didn't strip out that old drm but what's even more interesting is when you start these games it says dos box yep. as you're starting it mm -hmm. so it's emulation they're emulating yep the, yeah. and they're emulating these old games. Yeah. That's yeah, they're awesome. wrapping them up so that they can run. Yeah. 
Um, well, speaking of emulation, uh, Duck Station on Android may soon be shut down. I saw this from uh, Mr. Sujano. Um, really? He said, really well, what? I didn't hear this news. Kind of. Oh, no, okay. Kind of. So uh, <laughs> we'll, we'll he's, he posted a <laughs> screenshot of, uh, like, looks like a Discord message. And it says, the person who works on Duck Station, I guess they said, I plan for my next phone to be an iPhone. I'm done with Android after Google pulled the you must publish your legal name stuff. So apparently, the guy who makes Duck Station wants to remain anonymous. Yeah, Stenzik. Under, understandable. Stenzik, you said? Yeah. Is how you say that? Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, they want to remain anonymous. And now Duck Station might be going away. Russ, what do you think? Well, it's an open source app. I mean, he's always been really good about that. Stentic also works on PCSX2, so the PlayStation 2 emulator. That's why the UI for each of those look very, very similar. Um, but anyway, uh, he also like hosts the APKs, and so I'm not too worried about it. And to be honest, DuckStation is a pretty stable like, right. emulator at this point. They're still adding some things here and there, but it's like, it's good. Like, we're good, you know? And so I, 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 I think it sucks that like this idea that Google is going to be forcing people to use their full names, like their legal names is going to scare people. And I think emulator developers are really scared right now, oh, for sure. just in general. Yeah. And so another layer where it's like, Hey, we want to make it so it's easy for Nintendo to sue you. Like that's, <laughs> right. that's not going to be cool. And so that, that part is what worries me is that Google part of it, not necessarily the duck station thing. I think that emulation is like life in Jurassic park where we'll find a way. And so I'm not too worried <laughs> about that. <laughs> But at the same time, um, yeah, I just don't like this crackdown from Google about the full name thing. Yeah. Okay. That makes more sense to me. But yeah. Uh, when he said that, I was like, why is Stensic doing that? Uh, but I guess that makes sense. Uh, I'm such a huge fan of him just getting into the scene. Like, just like, because yeah. PCSX2 was in the, like, oof, it was in the olden days for the longest time. And, you know, for what it's worth, the developers had a bunch of, of issues that they had to tackle. The emotion engine of PS2 is the, just like the destroyer of computers. Uh, just having something that's like, how many how many digits in a floating point do you want? You want 20, 20 29, almost infinite amount of floating point <laughs> on there. And CPUs are just like, oh, no. This is like, what is a clear way to just destroy CPU emulation? So you have all this like stuff like hacky stuff. This is when we talk about accuracy and emulators, right? Um, a fully accurate emulator is super taxing on a CPU because then you're going to be doing these things that may not necessarily be necessary. So then you have things that emulators do is like, well, I don't need a bazillion points of floating point. Let's just do like at the hundredth place and just like chop that off and mm. not care about that. And then you, you know, sometimes you have problems that occur from the game playing because numbers don't line up and things get all wonky and stuff crashes. Um, so, a lot of the things on PCSX2 were just in the old days and just not good. And Stenza comes along and just l like pulls it all together. Just like, oh, all of this stuff, right. let's just, you know, everything that was like a problem in PSX2, I feel like Stenzik was just like MVP uh, of that, of that whole thing. And now PSX2 is like in a, in a, night and day difference so um i've just been a huge fan of the work that he does um so i'm glad that you know it, you know obviously we'll still have be able to get duck station but yeah when i duck station by itself is all of the stuff that he does is awesome so yeah the great thing about pcsx2 and those updates because I'm, I'm remembering back to like even like two years ago when i used to download that emulator i'm like first i don't know which one i'm supposed to download in the first yeah. place there's all these versions and you get it running and it's like for each game, you've got to go into the advanced yeah. settings and figure out all the... You have to go to the wiki page, figure out yeah. all the little things. And it may not work for your graphics card. You got to look at the other ones, all that kind of yeah. stuff. All that's automated now. You just start up God of War and it just starts working. There's no more like fuzziness that you have to go and change in the settings or whatnot. Yeah. It'll even warn you sometimes. It'll be like, hey, your rendering accuracy is not correct for this game. Change it to this. You know, and I, I think a lot of that has to do with Stenzik just like pulling that all together. Yeah. And so it may not be like the changes he made, but at least the team like changed their ethos in that way. And so, yeah, it's been really great. And so I'm not worried about Duck Station going away per se, just because um, just because of this one rule by Google on the App Store. All he really did is just warning that he's going to get an iPhone. So I don't know. Maybe we'll see it on iOS. I don't know. <laughs> Good luck. <laughs> <laughs>
uh, you know, you mentioned iOS just real quick. Um, Apple yanked uh, Epic's right to put games on there, and then they gave it back, and now they're under under investigation. Yeah. Um, but I feel like the fact that they yanked yanked it away was enough to convince other people that you know what I'm not going to put my game on alternative stores because those stores might just vanish mm. and then I don't have a relationship with my customers anymore but if I put it on the app store then I'm safe you know so I think that that's the reason that they did it but that's not even in the show notes so um moving on to you know what I think let's wrap up with uh, a question and uh, mm -hmm. then, well, we'll get to a question in just a second, but Fallout TV series. Are, did you guys watch the trailer? Did indeed. Okay, Russ no. did not watch the trailer. Um, Carrie? I'm so, are you hyped for this? I am so, I am over the moon. Dude, I am so hyped for this. It's like, uh, also them saying that like this is like parts of like Fallout 5. Like this is, mm -hmm. uh, they're going full canon. Like they're... They're embracing it. They're saying this TV series is inside the game's universe. The, like everything that happens in the TV show is happening in the game. And that is such a huge thing for me because it's night and day between whatever they did with the Halo TV series. Oh, gosh. Holy <laughs> Christmas. Did they just destroy <laughs> Halo? They just like, oh, uh, wh what was the, what's the, what's the one thing that we haven't done to Halo yet? We've kind of like, just destroyed it uh pretty good since 343 but what else can we do oh you know what let's just make a fan fiction tv show and uh just make it awful <laughs> and then here comes fallout the tv series and it's like no we're gonna make it a it's whatever happens here is canon in the universe and you haven't been to this place yet uh and it's it's gonna it looks awesome the only thing that i would say that i'm a little off put by is the dude that has just like the one eye the cyclops guy uh he looked a little strange to me but everything else, like the ghoul and all the other stuff, like he's like he's like you just put a little drop in a giant bucket of drugs, <laughs> and it's <Yeah>. like <laughs> uh, there's just so much to it that uh, I really really like the the power suit that that they that they have looks so good. Everything about it just looks fantastic. I'm so looking forward to. It. And you know we talked about this a few episodes ago about how uh, Amazon Prime now has ads, and I feel like. They were just like building up enough. They're like, well, we have the boys, we have Invincible. Oh, we have Fallout. Uh, we should probably start putting ads in Amazon Prime, right? We can charge people to remove them now <laughs> because we have a bunch of good stuff. And now Amazon Prime this year is insane. The amount of stuff that Amazon Prime has, it used to be, right? You used to be an Amazon Prime subscriber because you got two-day delivery for free. And Amazon Prime Video was just like, eh, it's a little bonus, whatever. And now it's becoming a service that you actually want. And it's really, I don't know when this changed, but I've actually been more of a prime user as of late uh, from the boys and the Invincible. And I've just found myself just going there more. And when I go there, they have stuff that's m like my demographic type of stuff. And I think it's like a Jeff Bezos thing, right? So there's like tons of stuff, like cheesy 80s stuff that's on there. So like, you know, we're going through and it's like, hey, free on Prime is Buckaroo Banzai. And I'm like, all right, <laughs> I'll watch that. That movie is insane. Um yeah, so there's like stuff like that that I think that they're just banging on all cylinders. But getting back to the point, Fallout, yeah, it looks amazing. I'm looking forward to it. The guy that they have, I, that Walton, the I, I don't want to say the star. He's not the protagonist. Um, like the protagonist is a a, a a woman that I don't I don't recognize her for any from anything. But like he's like a a supporting character it is Walton Goggins from Justified. Uh, he was in it, everything that I've seen him in. He is amazing. And I'm super excited to see him play this character. And it looks like he plays the character both before and after the apocalypse. Mm -hmm. And it's just, he, he's the guy that has no nose. And I'm, I'm so looking forward to that. I loved the time that I spent in Fallout 1 back in the day. I never played Fallout 2. Fallout 3 blew, blew my mind. I absolutely love that. Fallout New Vegas, really great game. Fallout 4, not a huge fan of. But Fallout, and then I never played the, what's the one that's a live service game? 76. 
76. Yeah, Fallout 76 I never played. But being able to sit down and watch a show that's set in this universe that I think that that a lot of people, uh, a lot of gamers relate to, uh, or not relate to, but that, like they want to know more about this world because that's what Fallout mm. was always good at is world building yeah L like the lore of what was happening in this world was interesting even past the story that you as a, a as a player were experiencing because there was just all this extra stuff that you got to find out about if you read stuff or if you listened to like the voice notes anyway that game looks or show looks awesome and I cannot wait to see it. Uh, and it comes out all episodes on the 11th, I think. Oh, really? They're, so, uh, oh, that's awesome. Just, uh, next month. But wait, they're doing like Netflix style, so you can binge it. I believe so. Let me, uh, if I look at every episode of it, will be available all at once on April 11th. <sighs> wow, amazing! You know, I didn't watch the trailer because I'm just excited, and so I like, didn't want to see anything ahead of time, kind of thing, you know. But I, I read a little bit, you know, like Brotherhood of Steel is yeah. in there. That's awesome. Yeah. I love Fallout Three, and so I'm lo looking forward. To I agree that Amazon is doing pretty well with their TV stuff, you know. In addition to what you mentioned, like I don't mind the Wheel of Time series as yeah. well as the Lord of the Rings ones, you know, like. I, I don't want to read the Wheel of Time books. Like they're just hard. They to are. Oh boy, like, they I, are. I, I got through seven of them. A lot of books. When, when the when the main author died, right. I was like, I knew that there were like four more books that he had written in that series, but I was like, no one's going to be able to do justice to what he started, so I just stopped mm. there. The show Wheel of Time, uh, I feel like I'm kind of okay on it. Lord of the yeah, Rings, for me I really it's better. Liked. Yeah. It yeah, gets better. For me, it's better than reading the books. That's the thing. You know, I don't want to read. I read the first book, and I was like the Wheel of Time book, and I was like, "This is not my style." Like the the amount of uh, just stuff in in the yeah. prose was too much yeah. for me. You know what I mean? Yeah. And so uh, I was like, I'd just rather watch a seven out of ten show than mm -hmm. read a five out of ten book for me from a literary standpoint. I'm not I'm not dogging on Wheel of Time series or any of that kind of stuff, but. Um, yeah, and so I, I appreciate that they just made it. I just hope they keep going, you know. And I, I like Brandon Sanderson, the guy who took over Robert Jordan's uh, writing for the, mm -hmm. the series. So I actually was looking forward to getting to him. Um, but all the same, I'd rather just watch it. So Yeah, there. Uh, so I only watched The Wheel of Time. I tried listening uh, whenever I would go to um, the gym and go on the treadmill. I would try to listen to different audiobooks. And uh, for me, Terry Pratchett books and The Wheel of Time are impenetrable uh, when doing like audiobooks, mm. like I'm on the treadmill, I'm trying to pay attention. And I remember, I remember distinctly because I was trying to follow along and I couldn't stop thinking of Snarf from Thundercats in my head. And, and the reason <laughs> okay. why is because the author, well, the guy, the narrator is like the Aes Sedai, the Aes Sedai. And I'm just like, yeah, I should die. And I'm just thinking of like Snark <laughs> saying this line. And it kept on coming up so often. And I was like, did they say what the Aes Sedai even is? Like, I feel like they glanced over right. it. Like, I'm in this war and this Aes Sedai, these people are amazing and I don't know what they are. I don't know who they are, but it's like, it just dropped me into this thing and I'm like trying to follow along. And Terry Pratchett books on audiobooks were like that as well. But he's like, it's like, here's this world, here's some crazy character names. And it's like, wait, is that a place or a person? What's <laughs> going on? Stop speaking for a second. I need to understand what's happening. Right. And um, we, my wife and I have watched Wheel of Time, and it's full of exposition. Like, the, the first – it's, like, heavy exposition. So it's, like, it doesn't get right. to the – like, the first series, they get to the cool, like, action-y stuff pretty fast. And then the second season is just, like, heavy, heavy exposition. And then it gets really cool at the other one, and it's a little bit uh, uh, just heavy, dense. But I still appreciate that. I really, I really like that. And I have to wonder if, if it's not a Jeff Bezos thing, uh, like he's just like throwing money. Uh, he's like, I love this mm. stuff. Have money and make it, make it so. What's that? The, the Silmarillion? Yes. Have money. Now go do it. <laughs> and right. uh, you know, Silmarillion is like, you know, not everyone's favorite part of the Lord of the Rings, but it's a whole bunch of backstory and stuff. I haven't watched any of the the um, the, Lord, the Lord of the Rings TV series from Amazon yet, uh, but they have a bunch of stuff that I feel like is interesting and it's true to the universe. And for me, that is such a big thing. And I'm The Last of Us, true to the universe. They had some deviations to it, but that was such a fantastic show. And you look at that, mm -hmm. and it, I, my wife watched it, and she really enjoyed it. And I was talking about the game and other parts of like part two, and you're like. 
you want that. And I don't know why this artistic, this is a sidestep of it real quick. And I don't know why we always have, you know, the, the phrase, the movie of something comes out and it goes, well, the book was better. And everyone always <laughs> right. says, well, the book is better. And I feel like, why is that the case? Why, why do they feel the need that when they have to make a movie of it, I can understand when you're trying to make it 90 minutes, right? There has to be an adaptation. There has to be something, but you can also make a longer movie. And you can also like condense parts and chop up stuff. But like going back to Halo and it's so atrocious, they threw everything out the window to the point where it's literal fan fiction and it's another universe. There is no longer the blue team. There's only silver team. Uh, Master Chief is awake when the fall of Reach is happening, which didn't happen at all. He was in cryostasis and he was on the pillar right. of autumn at that time. Like there's a bunch of stuff that doesn't make any sense. And then they have like a human that they revere because she's a chosen one that can, none of this happened in halo. And it's like, what are you guys doing? And I talked to some other people that have never played the game. They're like, Oh, I really like halo TV series. And I'm just like, why? Like, he's like, uh, because they don't <laughs> have that. They don't have those questions. Carrie. I know that it's... I get it, but it aggravates me to my soul. Would it have been so bad if it was just like the video game? Like when fallout five comes out, are people that don't know about fallout not going to enjoy it? And I submit that they still will. Yeah. The thing with Halo for me, I, I know we're kind of going off topic, but that's okay. Like, the thing with Halo is that I wanted to watch the show so that I didn't have to read the books very much like the Wheel of Time. I was like, there's so many books out there, but I want to know Halo lore. Like, I want to know what happened, like all that kind of stuff. And you're exactly right, Fox. Like, I was sitting there watching, you know, I don't know what episode it was in season two. And I'm like, I don't think Master Chief was on Reach. <laughs> I played that game. Yeah, yeah. You know what I mean? <laughs> and, uh, uh, but yeah, it's it's it really just messes with things and complicates it yeah. more. Now I got to read the books, you know, because the show isn't bailing me out and that kind of stuff. I almost feel like there's a better the better way to do it is just look up a YouTube video of someone that actually likes the lore and just gives you a synopsis mm -hmm. of what's going on, because the books unfortunately right. get uh, retconned to the point where they are also fan fiction. Uh -huh. Because how uh, Bungie initially started it was the game is uh, prime canon. Whatever happens in the game is actually what happens in the universe. If they ever wanted mm. to and change something that um, contradicts something that happened in a book or other media, that stuff didn't happen. What happened in the game happens. Mm. So because they did this thing, because they didn't um, value what was going on there, it, it, it made me stop reading the books because there are some parts that happen in the book but the game universe is actually well, that's why you need to kind of read like a uh, or watch a YouTube video of someone that actually is piecing together the game stuff for you and interfeeling stuff that hasn't been yet retconned from the books. And it constantly changes every mm -hmm. time a new game comes out. It's like, does that actually contradict anything? Oh, let me redo all this crap now. So uh, Halo is yeah. tough to follow from a lore perspective, even if you wanted to, uh, which is unfortunate. And uh, you know, oh, you know what? You look at the Star Wars thing, right? When Disney was like, oh, all that stuff mm -hmm. that came out. Um, they actually did a expanded universe. Yeah, they actually did a yeah. cool thing that I like because it's retconned, but it's retconned in such a way that all of the stories that took place in the expanded universe are technically legends. So it's legends that were passed right. through inside of the real Star Wars universe. It's like, oh, you hear about you know that? It's just a legend that was foretold. It was. It can potentially be true, but it actually still exists in the Star Wars universe. And that I can actually like. Mm. Oh, okay, that's kind of cool. That's cool. So they, they get yeah. the artistic license to do what they want with Star Wars, but these things are still legends that actually exist in the Star Wars universe, and I like that approach if you're going to retcon anything. I yeah, feel I'm like... I'm rereading the Thrawn trilogy right now. Like the, 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 the original, original one? three, like... Yeah, from Timothy Zahn, you know, mm -hmm. from the early 90s. And I'm on, I'm almost finished with the third one right now. And I'm like, this didn't happen, you know, because I'm just thinking about, like, movie canon, right. you know. Um, but I love the fact that they, they coexist like that. It's yeah. pretty awesome. Yeah, my wife and I are watching um, Bad Batch right now, hmm. uh, which if you haven't seen Bad Batch in Star Wars Rebels, you're missing out on some really, really good storytelling. Um, but on Bad Batch, like, they are, they're at Mount Tantus. Like they're they're at the place that's in the yeah uh, the the where Timothy Zahn book. trilogy where they go right. and they find Joris Kavath and all that stuff and uh, I think that that's super interesting that they're they're taking what they want from the legends and bringing it in and and adapting it and and putting it all together. Um, but talking about like this idea of a big shared universe, um, this was I didn't plan on talking about this on the show. 
but my, Microsoft just had uh, like a bunch of like a, a developer a partner showcase where they were showing off a bunch of games. One of those games is called Unknown Nine Awakening, and it looks like a cross between Assassin's Creed and I don't remember the name of the game, but there was a game on the 3DS where you could like possess things and possess people and take over and make them do stuff, right? And it's kind of like that mixed with Assassin's Creed. But the thing that's interesting about it is it has this shared universe where there's a comic book, there's mm -hmm. obviously a game, there's, I think, a novel, and like they have all of this stuff, and they're designing this world to have all of this lore right. that you can go and pick up outside of the game if you want. Yeah. I like that as an option, but it also makes me worry about when I if I play this game because I thought it looked really cool, am I going to feel like, "Oh, I'm missing out. I don't understand this." Um, am I going to have to go to YouTube and find somebody that read everything right. to explain it to yeah. me? Yeah. I always worry about people overextending themselves like the Zack Snyder Rebel Moon or oh, whatever. Right, yeah. He's like wants to put in comics and stuff I'm like, "Dude, just make a good movie." Like then we'll deal with the other stuff uh, later on. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like, don't overextend and put all that stuff out right now. Apparently, uh, anyway. the uh, director's cut of the Snyder cut of Rebel Moon is going to be coming later. So I was like, oh, all right, mm. I'll have to, I'll have to watch that. I said I watched a few episodes of it, and I was like, oh, it's okay. And then I just kind of trailed off from it. Um, but uh, now that mm. I know the Snyder cut is coming, I'll probably wait for that. Mm. Um, last thing. We had a message came in from Travis2894. They said, are you or any of the others on the podcast still using the Legion Go consistently? And do you think Lenovo will make a Legion Go 2 next year? Um, so I'll answer. If I'm playing a game on Windows, like if I'm playing a game that I can't play on my Steam Deck, I play it on my Legion Go. Um, that is my go-to Windows device. That being said, most of the time I am playing on my Steam Deck instead. It has a better screen. It is more comfortable. Um, the UI is better. I don't have to fight with Windows. But if I'm playing a game that requires Windows, that's where I go is the Legion Go. Um, Russ, you were never really a fan of the Legion Go, so I'm guessing the answer is no. Yeah, I haven't. I, I am working on a video, like an update video, like, hey, six months later, however long it's been, like, what what am I doing with this guy now? And um, I haven't done much. <laughs> so <laughs> those buttons, that, it really bothers me that, like, as I'm playing it, I push buttons accidentally. You know, it just, it's not something I ever got over, which is just mm -hmm. kind of weird as I'm playing it. Um, but one thing I did buy on Etsy is, like, a 3D printed case, not a case, like a holder that'll allow you to play it vertically. Oh. So you kind of put it on its side and then play it like that. Oh. Like slide the controllers in. So that way you can play like arcade, right? shoot them up. Yeah, exactly. Arcade shoot them up games. And we're like, you know, 3DS and Wii U and stuff. Like dual screen gameplay would be pretty awesome. Pinball. The crazy thing about that. Yeah, pinball. Yeah, you know, Like anything you can think of where you can just rotate the game and just play it vertically. Like you'll be able to do that there. You can rotate the screen or whatever. Um the the guy who sent me the thing, it was like 30 bucks on, on Etsy or whatever. He wrote me a whole letter like as like as he sent the package over and he's like, he said that the only reason he had the Etsy store was because of my channel and basically like being inspired, like by my other videos and stuff like that. And that's what started like him getting into this kind of stuff. And so it was just kind of like full circle thing, you know, where uh, I was able to buy his thing. No idea, you know, that there's any connection there or whatever, but it's pretty cool. Nice. So I'll show that off in my video, basically how to use that and pretty cool. But otherwise, yeah, I haven't been playing it much. Are you uh, still using yours, Carrie, or, or not at all? No, the only reason I keep it is I, I need to have it uh, for when I do the um, the uh, leaderboards for actual best performance uh, regarding total system power, which is still a mm -hmm. thing that I'm it's a it's a difficult task, but uh, the only the only reason I keep it is for that reason. Gamers Nexus just put out a very extensive video benchmarking it and testing uh, the Legion Go against other, you know, similarly priced handhelds, and it it performed pretty well in those benchmarking tests. Obviously, at low power, not nearly as well as the Steam Deck because the Steam Deck is the low TD, you know, the low power juggernaut that it's hard it's just hard for everybody else to compete with but when you were looking at games 
that were running on the Legion Go, it was doing fairly well in that Gamers Nexus video. So uh, if I remember, I will try and put a link in the description down below so people can check out that video. Uh, but the second part of Travis's question, are they going to pay uh, put out a, a Go 2 next year? I personally, like what, this came out in November, right? Or was it October? Yeah, it was late last year. It was late last year. I I fully anticipate that we will get uh, the next one this year at the around the same time. Just like we are anticipating the ROG Ally 2 um, after they kind of told everybody that that's what they were going to do. I fully expect Lenovo to treat this like a laptop and put out a new version every year. Um, Carrie, do you disagree with me? No, not at all. Uh, you know, there for what it's worth, the hardware on the Lenovo Legion Go is pretty. Uh, in, ter- in so far, if you wanted Joy-Con like type of functionality on a Windows PC handheld, the only one that you could put to actually recommend is the Lenovo Legion Go. It's the only one that operates how you would think it would operate, as close as possible mm-hmm. to that. Uh, so they kind of own that market in so far as that form factor. And I think that they could, to Russ's point, design it better so that the buttons aren't so, like, you know, terrible. <laughs> like, you know, like when in terms of just general use. I don't really care about it. I can kind of disregard in my head. But there are also with using the... um fps mode thing i think that could be designed a little bit better because that felt it felt a bit it, it's a neat feature that i felt wasn't executed a hundred percent uh so i think that could either go or uh be updated to a certain degree but go. like when you look at the low Nova legion go it's like <laughs> chunky and like almost an industrial way there like the design phase didn't really get get enough into it yet uh but you know you look at the z2 that's going to be coming out and it's not going to be all that much better than the z1 uh, well, the AMD hasn't even talked about a Z2, but more than likely the Z2 is just going to be an 8840U, which is not all that much different from a 7840U. So your only real upgrades are like going to like 32 gigs of system RAM, which would be an, a nice bump. Uh, they could make a better display. Um, they could slimline it a bit, make the design a lot better. Uh, you know, just overall sprucing it up and not so much be a performance improvement, but be a, uh, a an iterative improvement and spruce up in terms of other system performance uh benefits like having more memory much like how it would and OLED. yeah exactly like there's there's things that they can do uh that could still make it pretty awesome so i anticipate yes that they would also because there isn't anyone else that makes a joy con like thing that lenovo has already done and proved that they can do it well that's not a selling point for me. I don't know, like the like the Joy Cons. Like when I when they showed them off, I was like, "That's really interesting." I love that they were doing something different. Mm-hmm. But once I got it in my hands, I was like, "Yeah, I'm never taking these." You know, off. there's some there's there are people that <laughs> like the idea not so much for Joy Con use, but to actually transform the Lenovo into a tablet that they use as a tablet, and that is what mm. I've heard a lot of people uh, oh, okay. wanting that feature uh, specifically. I don't know why I don't get really uh, uh, crazy about this, but it's like on like the GPD Win Max 2 has there's covers over the controller because there are people that are self-conscious about having gamer type of like appearance on these devices. So they want to hide that. And the Lenovo Legion Go allows them to hide the gamer part of the thing. And it's still a very good tablet afterwards. Like it's a fantastic tablet by itself. So... It's a little mm. thick for it's it's too thick to use as a tablet in my opinion. Sure, but you know it has the kickstand and it's super performant, and mm-hmm. I mean when you look at it for what it is, it's pretty good. So it, it's that weird threshold, like the Venn diagram of people that don't want to have gamer aesthetics but still want to have it available to them, where they can just attach it onto there. So not so much like how the Joy-Con is, where you're looking at it because. You know, like you can use the two Joy Cons as two controllers, which is a neat idea that is kind of not great, but you know it does work on the Switch. Uh, it doesn't work on the the, the Go, but um, I like it because you know, for if you want to go on a treadmill and you know you want to hold the controllers in your hands and you don't, you can just you know sway your arms and use it. Um, mm-hmm. I when I start going back to the gym because I have to, uh, I want to give that a go. I want to see how that works out. Yeah, I was I looking at that, some of my uh, old videos, they... and I was I need to get back on the treadmill. <laughs> what were you saying, Russ? 
I think for the Legion Go 2, I just hope that the whatever controller thing they do, I hope they improve it, obviously. But just make it backwards compatible with the old Legion oh, Go right. 1 as well mm-hmm. and then sell it as separately. That's the whole thing I've wanted this whole time is just some upgraded controls. You know, give us the option. You have this whole world now where because we have these detachable Joy-Cons, we can try all sorts of different things and they haven't done a thing about it. And so it's a huge wasted opportunity. Um and I agree with with uh, Carrie and the idea that like make it a tablet, like have have some sort of tablet aspect to it as well, because it is kind of neat in that regard too. I know that like Bob Wolf uses it in tablet mode a lot, and so it's kind of cool. I will say when I first got a teleprompter, and I wanted to shoot something that wasn't here, I ended up putting the prompter software on my Legion Go yeah. so that I could be in a different location because it was so much smaller than. Right my laptop uh so that that was something that was useful i did it once and then i never did it again but i i really do hope that they bring out another one and i hope that they take another look at those joy cons and and get rid of or at least you i'm with you russ i when i'm using it i hit those buttons on the back they don't do anything because i have them set up to not do anything but my brain feels that i pushed a button and i it's a distracting thing my brain says, mm-hmm. oh, you screwed up. And I'm like, oh, no, I didn't. Everything's fine. It doesn't matter. I, I have that not, not set to anything. Um, I, I would like to see that simplified or at least give you know the option to have it simplified. But um, if you guys are still using your Legion Goes, uh, let us know uh, down below. And uh, that's going to do it for this episode of the Nerd Nest Podcast. Uh, you guys could have hung out with anybody, but you decided to hang out with us for... Uh, an hour and a half so thank you very much carrie what's your next video man uh, the video i was supposed to do last week so i'm finishing it up today this is the asus g16 laptop and then i have the g14 afterwards uh really impressed with it uh super impressed with it asus really is banging on all cylinders on their on their latest stuff so uh there's a bunch that i want to talk about and that video i'm hoping will come out tomorrow monday awesome at uh, youtube.com slash the fox. fox and you can see it on his shirt if you're watching the video version of this uh, how to spell it. Russ, you're going on vacation, but I'm betting you're recording a whole bunch of stuff before you go. I sure am. Yeah, I'm cramming all sorts of stuff in. So my next video is going to be on this thing. This is the, the MIG, MIG switch? switch flash cart. Okay. So there we go. I got it in focus. So uh, this thing, there's been videos about it already. We talked about it on this podcast already too, but I got one in hand and I've got a lot of thoughts about it. I'm not going to do like, hey, how to you know illegally show like playing games on the switch right now that's the worst thing in the world um but i am going to talk about it and i've got this as an example of some of the discussion points that i think are kind of revolutionary uh when we talk about nintendo switch and it's probably going to make nintendo very mad so we'll see how that goes and because he's going on vacation you won't be seeing russ on the show for a couple of weeks but i was just looking at the calendar everybody and we are coming up on the one year anniversary of the first episode of the nerd nest podcast so um on the 31st which is a couple sundays from now i think you'll be back by then russ i will yeah. you will i think that's that's very close to when we did the first episode of the show and i just gotta say you know just a quick update to tell people about overall how the show's been doing um it's really crazy how many people tune in and watch this show each week. And I very, very much appreciate it. Um, in the first year of this show, uh, not counting this episode, uh, by the way, but uh, this show has been on YouTube, been viewed uh, almost 900,000 times for this podcast, which is just crazy. So I really appreciate that. And then thousands upon thousands of people listen to the audio show. So if you're somebody who watches the show or listens to the show, uh, I just know that I pre- I appreciate you. You guys are awesome. And if you want to, you know, listen to the show ad free and you don't want to have to deal with any of the ads or stuff that's on YouTube, then uh, you can check out the Patreon. There's a link down below uh, that like button. And uh, I hope you all have a fantastic day. And Russ, we'll see you when you get back, man. Thanks. Appreciate it.